What? <laughs> Could you hear me? Okay, good. So I got to tell you how this class went last week, and I had to announce it at 10 because I was so distressed I had to kind of work it out before I could preach. And, and that is, and some of you heard me say this, uh, I actually woke up last week and realized I'd lost 10 pounds, which was great. But then James Ratliff says to me after class, he said, you know, that camera adds, adds 10 pounds to you. So uh, you ruined my day. I just want you to know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're, um, uh, we're in part four, the nature of the church. Uh, and next week we're going to talk, this week we're going to talk about the doctrine of God. Then the following week we're going to talk about sin and grace and redemption. And I think then we're into the, the next class will actually be to talk, I think it's the next class, about um, our diocese and what that larger life looks like. Uh, because Jesse and I have to go down to El Paso for um, our Senate meeting. And, um, and our Senate meetings are good, and particularly with Bishop Orgy, some interesting things come forth from those meetings that need to be shared with the larger community and it's sort of an existential exercise in what it's like to be part of uh, the larger church. Sandy's mom and I used to be part of the largest church in the Diocese of Colorado together. And we had lots of interesting conversations over the years about um, how they were or were not the church. <laughs> but um, in, it, long time ago, uh, under Bishop Fry and then Jerry Winterrode. Is that what? Oh yeah, yeah, we left the Episcopal Church in 2007. So we're 11 years out from the Episcopal Church. No, we moved here in 2009, isn't that right? Well, see, Robert McLeod, see, I, I say in my sermon this morning, you begin to look like those you hang out with. <laughs> this is really problematic for me because I was, <laughs> Kurt and I have this problem with Robert McLeod. We're hanging out with him a lot. And I don't know, it's taken years off our life. <laughs> and, and we've regressed, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> but Robert preached a great sermon a few weeks ago where he talked about Christians live into the future and the past is the past is behind us and it's redeemed into the future and it's no longer that which drags us down. It was a great sermon. I haven't gotten over it. That was a month ago. I was uh, texting with Robert at 5 o'clock this morning. He was... Uh, he went to a wedding in Washington and drove his car that has over 300,000 miles on it to Washington. He's doing all the high points, climbing all the highest points in each state. And uh, he was camping the other night at the foot of Mount Hood next to a group of snowboarders. I coached him through the night <laughs> so that all would be well. So he's on his way, he's on his way home now. Um, well, we're going to talk about the doctrine of God. Um, this is the doctrine, by doctrine we mean the formal teaching about God. Um, and the formal teaching is important to us because, um, for a lot of reasons, but primarily for me, the formal teaching lets me know when what my experience, what I'm experience of God, experiencing of God is actually God and not some other thing, some wish about God, some what I'd do if I were God, uh, some miscomprehension about God. Um, there's a lot of that around. Uh, 
when, um, when Jesse and I were with Bishop and Brenda Dobbs a few weeks ago, um, one of his clergy was uh, preaching a prosperity gospel, uh, which is not, it, not anything to do with the doctrine of God. It's the wrong doctrine of God. And while we were there over the time through attorneys and stuff, he removed that congregation from the church. Couldn't be anymore. Um, in other words, he violated our church's doctrine of God and so could no longer uh, function in that way as, a, as a, both a priest and a parish. So the doctrine of God is the formal teaching of God, not something of human devising. Um, but uh, our doctrine of God is the human, the doctrine is actually the human expression are words that express God's revelation of himself to us. Uh, and God reveals himself, the doctrine of God comes from the inspired word of Holy Scripture and in the person of Jesus. We see who God is. Those, those two things. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the church has... Uh, the job both of articulating that in the earliest church and then safeguarding that revel revelation from individualization, from being uh, personal. You know, we talk about the episcopate being locally adapted, um, but we don't have a locally adapted doctrine of God. We have a doctrine of God, and the primary role of a bishop is, isn't it, Bishop Williams, is to safeguard that truth. So that's why bishops, um, if you're with a bishop, you'll, you'll hear them call some priest up and rattle his cage when he hears something is not right in the priest doctrine of God. We're held accountable to that. Uh, well, in uh, the inspired Holy Scripture, in other words, the Holy Spirit is involved in that through the inspiration. Good, that, I mean, that's a good point. Uh, and the uh, what the Holy Spirit does, I mean, this is, this is important that we understand that we receive that revelation. That's, that's what in theology we mean by reason. Reason isn't our ability to have ascendancy, but to receive. So reason, rather than being in charge by way of our intellect, is a secular notion of reason the religious understanding of reason is one of humility on our knees to open our hearts. The Holy Spirit opens our hearts to receive that revelation. Uh, and so, I mean, I've always said that's why seminaries should, uh, as opposed to academic institutions, should be full of people of moderate intelligence. Uh, because uh, people like Tom Wright, who I admire and, and care about, Tom's an academic, so he thinks through and does all the study that we should then be able to receive and translate. So, um, and so one of the things I always say, I think I said it last week, that ordination means you're under orders and you give up speculative thinking. Uh, my job is not to do speculative thinking, which is good because I don't do speculative thinking. Um, I'm not very speculative. I'm not very insightful is what that means. Um, uh, but um, uh, th our job is, as a priest under a bishop is to safeguard uh, the revelation from individual individualization. Um, but it is the truth about God. God abides in his church and in the context of the church's life, which is the life of the body of his son, God le leads his church by the Holy Spirit into the fullness of truth that he has revealed about himself. That's, that's what that means. That's what our job is. God, uh, that's why we have a church. I mean, when people go off and just determine God on their own, even when they're reading scripture on their own, it, it it doesn't, it doesn't bring them to the fullness of truth. Uh, the, the church is the body of Christ in which God abides, uh, and uh, God leads his church by way of the Holy Spirit, active in the hearts of believers, into the fullness of truth 
that he himself has revealed about himself. And so it is in that context that we come to understand who God is. John 16, 13 through 15 says it this way, and particularly Johanna, and we've just kind of gotten into John this Easter season, and I hadn't read John in a long time, and, and his language is, it's sort of just, you say, oh my goodness, I need to explain this to people. Um, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is active and involved in that process. This is one of those phrases that makes me not agree with Acna, for example, that puts uh, through the Father, uh, the Spirit proceeds through the Father and the Son, and they put in the Son in parentheses. That's pretty clear, through the Son. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not questionable at all. Dogmatic theology is, um, is really the ordinance, the belief, the teaching, that is necessary for salvation. That, so dogmatic theology it used to be in seminary. Did you get these, Mike? This, it, in seminary, back in the days before computers, uh, everybody judged your intellect by the number of books you had in your library at home. And, and we were all eager to get Hall's dogmatic theology. Did you get those? It, it's a great theology book, very Anglo-Catholic, that takes about this much space on the shelf. So we were all eager to get it to fill out what we could afford in seminary so that we look like we are smarter than we were. But dogmatic theology is really a statement of basic, absolute, and unchangeable truth. Uh, and there's no application, there's no relativism in it. Dogmatic theology is stating the absolute truth. Um, so our doctrine that which is revealed by God, about God, and about ourselves is not a creation of worldly limitations, but it's created by God who is beyond this world, who in fact created this world, who is not bound by our failures and shortcomings and does not adjust his truth uh, to suit those or affirm those, but to redeem them. That's what's, uh, we don't come to church to be affirmed or say that's okay, everybody does it. Um, you know, that we don't have that kind of theology. We have this absolute dogmatic theology and in that dogmatic, in that doctrine of God, what we hear is that God redeems and transforms us, not affirms and allows us. See how much different that is? Uh, and, and you can, and, and that, in a sense, is, is what distinguishes a Christian church from some kind of sect that calls itself Christian. Because there isn't that sort of information or veering from the word or relativism or change of the word. Uh, the basic, um, um, so, the, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of God, and other doctrines that we'll come across in this class um, has nothing to do with emotional reactivity and is not something discernible all on our own, but it is a revelation which the church holds and disseminates to us. Does that make sense? So we don't come here and say, oh, well, we discerned exactly the same as this church, so we like it. That's church shopping. People decide who God is, then they come to a church where they hear their version of God preached. And what's amazing is how many churches they have to go to. Uh, it's really difficult sometimes to find the figment of their imagination shared by the church because what you'll find is the clergy and the churches for the most part, or used to be anyhow, were all really trained in the doctrines of the church. 
So you go from one church to another, and the doctrine, the dogmatic theology is going to be the same, uh, basically the same. At least it used to be in the Episcopal Church, but then there, uh, last week there was a Presbyterian in class, and they're quite discern, uh, disturbed because uh, I said, now the, there may be a problem with the Presbyterians, I don't know. Um, actually, the, there's no problem with the Presbyterians. Their basic doctrines are the doctrines of the church. The basic uh, theological statements of the doctrine of God are the Apostles and Nicene Creed, and if we were going to sign something as a, if we were a confessional church, which we are not, we don't sign the Westminster Confession, uh, that's what we would sign, uh, the creeds. Uh, the Apostles' creeds came from that which was recited at baptisms in the earliest church that the Apostles put together. The Nicene Creed is the product of a process that began at the Council of Nicaea in 325, and we hold to these creeds because uh, they perfectly, in themselves, by much discernment and acceptance over all the course of church history, um, everyone agrees that they align with Scripture as interpreted through the ages. In other words, there's a consistency in the basic creeds. And it, it's interesting in some of these freer churches that you'll see on their websites um, that uh, they'll say, We've, we, we just came across this thing called the Apostles' Creed. And it's really cool. You wouldn't believe. Nobody's disputed it through history. This is the agreement. And it aligns perfectly with the Bible. So we, we've actually started to say it once a month. We say it every time we worship. Morning and evening prayer, Apostles' Creed, Communion, Nicene Creed, not a service without the creed. Um, it, we've always done that. Uh, the Catholic Church has always done that um, because we believe the creeds summarize the message and the historic events of Scripture. Uh, and we also hold the creeds to be the true faith, that God is true. And we do that because we believe God is truthful to us uh, and the creeds are the true revelation of God. We believe that God wills our well-being, and if we live our lives in the, in the context of the truth that's stated in the creeds, our lives will be better for it. Uh, they'll be running in, uh, um, what's the guy's name? Um, Hauerwurst, Stanley Hauerwurst, wrote a, a, a book called uh, Against the Grain of the Universe. He's an eth ethicist. Um, but th the creeds shape and form our life and give us an understanding of who God is and who we are and what's to come of all that uh, that puts our lives headed in the grain of the universe. Uh, and so they're sort of running like a, a train running along the railroad tracks. It, it stays on track. It gets where it's going. And so the creeds are like a railroad track for us. And we can trust them because God is truthful to, to us about who he is and how he's acted and what his intentions are. And uh, we know he wishes our well-being. So to live in that context um, uh, sets us in the right direction. And that God engages us in the midst of that truth. When we're thinking along that frame of reference, then we're, we've already set ourselves in the context to hear his truth. Uh, sometimes Jesse will come and talk to me about one thing when I'm thinking about another. And the older I get, the less I can think about two things at the same time. Um, where's Doug, Doug Tomerlin? I was changing my sermon a little bit, and Doug came to talk to me about the sprinkler system, and I was going, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> um, But see, when, when we engage in that truth simply by saying the creed, it puts us in the same subject matter in the same context is the God who is speaking to us. So God engages us in that truth. And that's important because Christianity, Bill O'Reilly, when he was on TV, um, and you see how well it worked out for him about his understanding of Christianity, uh, he said Christianity is the best philosophy. Uh, dr drove me nuts. 
Christianity is not a philosophy. It's a relationship with a God who encourages us, who judges and convicts us and redeems us. It's a relationship. It's not a... It's what... what yeah. Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah, don't listen to... The, well, you can't listen to the Gospel of Bill O'Reilly anymore. It's a, and blissfully taken off the air. Um, that um, So Christianity is a relationship, and we are involved in that relationship uh, in a transcendent way with God. And I keep saying that, that word transcendent during, these, uh, during the season of ascension, uh, because the ascension is uh, Christ no longer walking along with us, but he's ascended into the heavens, so the only way to have a relationship through Christ to God is in a, in a transcendent sort of way. And that's how we enter into that relationship with God. It's a, it's a relationship that um, by the efforts of the Holy Spirit, our hearts and minds are lifted upward to God, uh, out of this world and upward toward God. Uh, and we experience that. That's what, why do we come to communion? Well, first of all, it's Holy Communion. So by definition, if it's communion, union with God, it's got to be transcendent. And, and uh, so Christ ascending is humanity being taken up into heaven, and we go along with that. But at Christmas, humanity, uh, uh, God came down to earth, so there's this sort of up and down ladder thing of angels and archangels that, that happens in the midst of all that. And that's a holy mystery. See, we can't overdefine it. But God comes to us, we ascend to God. The whole story of scripture is about God coming to us and us ascending to God. And in that transcendent moment, in those what Peter Gomes calls thin places uh, in life, where our worldly life is, uh, is less captivating to us, we ascend and experience uh, God's life. <clears throat> so, what do the creeds, uh, there's all this great mysticism around that, which, um, which Anglicans are in the process of, of forgetting, and we need to think about that. I'm going to talk about um, uh, Howard, uh, Hilton in the scales of this transcendent relationship in Julian of Norwich and all the great Anglican mystics uh, who beautifully described uh, that kind of what we call mystic sweet communion with God. Uh, so, uh, what do the creeds say about God? Well, they say a number of things. They say that, um, one, God is alive, revealing himself not as a concept to be grasped or claimed, uh, to have ascendancy over intellectually, but God is alive, and the best words that, uh, that you read everywhere, that he abides in us and we abide in him. In other words, there's a relationship. So this God is alive. He's not something that we control. He's something with whom we have a relationship. Secondly, God is personal, meaning God is a particular person. Uh, God said to Moses, I am that I am. I've always loved that phrase. What confidence God has about himself. <laughs> I am that I am. Uh, tell the people of Israel, I am has sent me. Modern women have said, himself said so. Uh, that's, uh, uh, or guys turn around and say, uh, herself told me to do this. Um, but uh, Isaiah, um, Isaiah 52, 6 says, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day they shall know that it is I who spoke. Here I am. In other words, God is a God who is particular as we are particular. This is what argues against this sort of spiritual sponge that people think is sometimes heaven. No, we are distinct individuals created in the image of God who is a distinct individual and we relate to him person to person in a personal relationship. 
not in a mass relationship, although in the mass, which you might call the church, I wonder if this is why the Catholics call communion the mass. Uh, anyhow, uh, we, we nudge one another in that direction. We share and support each other in that faith. And we relate individually as we relate uh, to God. Uh, um, if, if we do not deal with God on a personal level, we are not really dealing with God at all. We're dealing with somebody else's concept of God. Thirdly, God is unique. God is God and there is no God over him. No one created him. No one judges him. No one commands him. All that exists was created by God's command. God is not limited by time and space. God defines what is good. He defines mercy, kindness, and justice. And there is no other standard possible. The uniqueness of God. God is God. Steve. Sure, and that's well, and and that's why we say the psalms in every service, and and we read the psalms constantly. I mean, how many times, Bishop, do we, if we read morning prayer, evening prayer, and celebrate communion, how many times do we say the psalms in a year? In a month. Yeah, we say all the psalms every month. So, so. We're very rooted in that Old Testament creational view of God uh, as Anglicans and not in these philosophical musings about God. Uh, and, and so some of the great theologians within Anglicanism uh, are, for example, Al Alistair McGrath, Dr. Alistair McGrath, his doctorate's in biology. It's not in theology. And yet... He's one of the best theologians in the church. I mean, I've got his books all over the place. I always look back to see what Alistair has to say uh, about things. Uh, John Pockinghorn uh, is the quantum physicist whose books are just terrific about science and religion. That the, that the earth reveals God is certainly true. When you look at things around you, I mean, I'm with people all the time and say, God is amazing to have created that because the only explanation for creation is God. I mean, when you, the further you look at creation and how things work, it's the only answer you can come to, God. And people say it all the time. I mean, you just look at, um, uh, I won't say what it, you don't look at. Um, I, was looking, I was going through papers and found a video of, my, of a colonoscopy the other day. That's what I, um, I didn't know if I needed to save that for the court or what. I, um, let's, let's move to God as sovereign. Um, uh, God is the source of all life and existence, and nothing, nothing exists without God's initiative that's outside of God's purpose that God doesn't use for his purpose and does not have his permission. God is sovereign over all things. God rules over all things. 
Uh, fifth, uh, so we can get done in time, God is free. He is not bounded by anyone or anything. Uh, his promises are acts of free will. Uh, God cannot be forced or, or coerced or bribed or coddled or negotiated with. Those are all my additions to the doctrine of the church. Uh, the that he can't be negotiated with. And people negotiate all the time with God. God, if you just get me out of this situation, I promise I'll be good. And then as soon as you get out of the situation, sure, I got that handled before God could even respond to me. You know, we just take credit for it ourselves. Uh, God is one. Deuteronomy uh, 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh, Article 1 of the 39 articles starts right there. There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body, parts, or passions, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. Uh, God, in other words, is not at war with himself. Um, Then uh, God is changeless. Uh, I am the Lord, Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Uh, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And this is what the 39 articles means. Uh, uh, um, without, to be God is without um, passions, meaning he's not emotionally volatile like we are. Uh, God is stable and consistent. He's not changeless. So Whatever he is and whatever he promises us is totally, absolutely dependable. We can rely on it because it's just not in his nature to flip-flop. So when you get a theology that says, well, we think God has changed his mind on this. That's contrary to the church's doctrine of God. God hasn't changed his mind. All that is was created with his permission and by his action and it is set in the beginning as he intended it to be. And everything that changes is a result of the fall. So it's a distortion of what God originally intended. So we look at scripture to see what God intended, and then we know whether something is right or wrong, whether it's blessed in what God wants, or it's something of which we repent. Um, Yes, Lucia. Right, absolutely. The creation was good. It was right. It was correct in the beginning. Yes, yes, exactly. And that's a good way to phrase it. The crea- uh, Lucius said, the point is that the creation was good. It was right. It was what God intended. And everything worked in harmony together. And the fall is what distorts it. Uh, so we look at what God intended uh, in creation. Uh, let's see. Uh, any, um, where did where'd I go? Oh, uh, finally, and this is what the Sunday after next is. Next Sunday is Pentecost, then comes uh, Trinity, the Trinity. Um, God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, well attested in Scripture. Uh, Article 1, again, of the 39 articles uh, describes the Trinity in this way. Uh, and in unity of this Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And and so I'll be preaching on that next Sunday. But there are not three gods. There are not three parts of God. There are not three ways of talking about God because there is one God in three persons living internally those three persons in perfect harmony and unity of purpose and for love among those three persons. And that perfect love is the love that spills out and why, as I said last Sunday in my sermon, um, we describe God, that say that God is love. That God is love is not a projection of what we understand love is, but a love among the three persons of the Godhead that flows out and erupts and is reflected in creation. So the creation in its intricacy and the working together uh, of the parts 
uh, our son Zach did this uh, documentary on uh, Hannah Ranch, which is down south of town. And in that documentary, uh, he shows how the development out here on the plains and the lack of cow fertilization with seeds that blow up into the mountains leads to defertilization of the mountains. And in the 30 years we've lived here, as things expand east and the houses and pavement um, develop and push out the cattle in the fields and the seeds, there is a place right up on the mountain that has grown equally to it that's barren, just rock. So as we develop Colorado Springs, we deforestize Pikes Peak. Um, it, God, the intricacy of God's creation is when we mess with it, it runs afoul of itself. Um, so um, that's where. Yeah. <laughs>